So traditionally, how does it go? Hiya. <laughs> so, um, wow, what an awesome event. Have you all enjoyed yourself? Firstly, it's a great honor to be closing B-Sides Liverpool. When Jen spoke to me back in November and said, I want to do B-Sides in Liverpool, I was like, fuck yeah, uh, let's do that. So when it came around, she asked for sponsors. We were super happy to get involved. So what I would like you all to do is give Scalsasek, Jenny, all of those lot a big round of applause because today wouldn't have happened without them. Okay, so I'm going to do Machiavelli's Guide to InfoSec. Uh, uh, put your hands up if you know who Machiavelli is. Awesome. You guys get up here. I'll sit there. <laughs> so, um, okay, before we start, <sighs> this is the emotional bit. Uh, if I start crying, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to dedicate this talk to my, uh, to our much missed brother, uh, our much missed brother, Mike, who passed away at the end of March. Uh, after a nine-month battle with uh, bowel cancer. Um, it left a huge hole in everybody's heart. Um, but I would like you to try and remember Mike for saying wonderful things like this. Super, I I'm not going to read for you, by the way, right? You, you can manage. And he would appreciate that too. Um, but he's left a huge hole in our heart. And one thing that I was kind of hoping that you would all do for me is maybe after three that we could all tell cancer to go and I think he would appreciate a big cheer of fuck cancer. So after three, one, two, three, fuck cancer! <laughs> and deep breath. Um... You are all very privileged because I didn't cry once there, so uh, that will be your turn later on once I'm finished. Like, oh, God, is he not shut up yet? I want to go and get burgers. So anyway, me. Um, this is this is me. I'm sure you can see that. Um, some stuff about me because I'm supposed to do that, right? So I'm a CTO. Um, I'm the living embodiment that they really will give that title to anyone. Um, I'm actually double CTO right now, so I'm an, inter uh, an interim CTO for another company at the same time, woohoo, because that's fun. Uh, mostly I help build security teams, because um, fuck, why not? Um, they're very complex, very complex people. We love hacking shit, that's the obligatory, uh, we've seen this a million times. We do some very weird incident responses, we do some normal ones. But some of them are quite weird. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm just going to leave you like that. We do some defending. I'm sorry. I mean, blue teaming. I believe that's the popular term for defense nowadays. Uh, uh, every now and again, I have to speak to some graybeards at work. And they've been struggling to get their head around what DevOps means. Until I explained to them, that's what we used to call Linux system admins. And they were like, oh, shit, right. Got ya. Um, so yeah, def blue teams are what we called defending back in the day. I spend an ever-increasing amount of time talking about risk. Um, <laughs> That's not risky. No, but this is. I spend a lot of time talking about recognizing risk, uh, which is... If I have to explain this side to you, right, it's been a very long day, I'm sorry. Um, and of course, I spend a lot of time telling people that a lot of risk is bloody predictable. Um, he must have known this was going to happen. Come on. Um, who remembers this story? Yeah. Lol. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, one of the biggest risks that we deal with mostly is people being dumb. Um, <laughs> I, I try, I try to be patient, very patient, but sometimes I just wonder, could we try a couple of years without the warning labels? Just maybe, maybe we could let the universe help us. Um, oh shit, yeah, and one of the weird things that happened to me is I met my actual to God nemesis last week. Um, don't worry, I will explain. Um, it's quite weird. I mean, I know what a nemesis means, um, and if you don't, well, let this already explain it to you. Um, but 
I became an interim CTO for a company recently. I'd done a lot of work with them for a while. So when everything went, ah, they called me and uh, called our company in and off we went. And uh, I spoke to their customer care team. They didn't feel like they had much input with the, the, the technology departments of the company. No great surprise there in that story, right? And uh, they spoke to me and I said, hey, look, I tell you what, don't mean to sound like a prima donna, but I run six calendars at the moment, speak to my assistant and I will, we, we'll sit down and we'll work this list out and get through the problems. Cool, no problems. So anyway, my colleague came up to me and went, you, you, you've got an appointment with Loki, right? I'm like, what? He said, no, no, you've got an appointment with someone called Loki. So enter stage left Loki. So <clears throat> right enough, my colleague was right. I did have an, uh, uh, an appointment with Loki. Now, the reason that that might not sound very interesting to you is it took me a second to realize why my colleague had asked. So here is Loki. Put your hands up if you know who Loki is. Cool, right? So as you know, I work for a company called Vindla. Actually, I'm one of the founders of the company. So I spoke to Link, uh, to Loki and I said to her, uh, we had the meeting, business meeting, conference room. She walks in, I walk in and says, I is it really Loki? Always Loki. Really? Yeah. So that's fucking brilliant. My colleague was, you concerned my colleague recently. So why? I says, well, you know, I presume you know the Norse mythology about your name. Yeah, of course. Cool. Well, Avinla, we really love Norse mythology too. We've got a fucking, we've got a, a Viking ship. There's a logo, right? We, we love it. I said, so, um, you might not know, but Vinla's actually named after a Norse god too. I said, really? Which Norse god? I said, well, Heimdall. And we both started laughing, but I appreciate that you guys might not know who, might not know the significance between Loki and Heimdall being in the same room. Um, but we kill each other in Ragnarok, um, which is cool. Uh, and I said to her at the time, I'm like, wow, uh, it's not often you actually meet your actual nemesis at work. Because if you know the Norse mythology, you know that Loki and Heimdall have been enemies forever and they kill each other in Ragnarok. And she was like, wow, that's amazing. It's cool. I'm like, yeah, 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 it's cool. Obviously, we were a bit concerned that this might be the end of the world, but, you know, bar that, How's things going? So um, <clears throat> I said to her, look, I'm going to ask you a really strange question. So yeah, sure. I said, can I, can I take a selfie with you? I've never asked some, this of someone before, and I know it's a little bit weird. And she's like, y yeah, sure. I was cool. I took the selfie. And then I said, okay, so now the weird part. And she's like, oh, that, what do you mean, the weird part? Well, I'm speaking in a conference in Liverpool, and I wondered if I could use the, the, the picture. And she's like, uh, yeah. So, everybody, this is Loki. Um, and she's promised to leave her sharp things for me at home on Ragnarok, but I don't know if to believe her or not anyway. But like I say, meeting your nemesis is quite an interesting thing, right? So, anyway, I die. Cooper! <laughs> ah, but anyway, I digress. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about Machiavelli's guide to InfoSec. Or really using yesterday's knowledge to kind of secure tomorrow's future just for that spin, right? Just, I feel like I'm in the, the cyber world right now. So here's Machiavelli. He was very devious looking. Um, not to be confused with the other Machiavelli. Um, Tupac changed his name towards the end to Machiavelli. Uh, read the book in prison, and actually the album cover is a uh, a parody of each other. But we're not we're not talking about Tupac. They talk about uh, Niccolo Machiavelli. So he wrote a book in 1513, and it was a little bit controversial to say the very least. Um, as a rule goes, if the Catholics don't like your book so much so that they make an entire list that says. These books are not allowed to be read, and the person that started that list was Machiavelli. I probably want to read Machiavelli, right, at that point. So he was super controversial, but really the book is about an amoral guide to power and governance, right? Um, it's had a bad press over the years, some of it, because a lot of assholes have read it too, to be fair, but, you know, moving on. Did I mention it was controversial? 
Um, Kim Davis recently. Rosa Parks. I don't fucking think so. Uh, but the Prince. So back to the book. Super controversial. Put your hands up if you've read it. Long time ago. Everybody says that, right? So, as I said, it is a rule about governance. It's a rule, it's a book about how to manage or obtain power and how to keep it. That's why people like Nixon had it by their bedside. However, uh, as we know, this is not NAM. There are rules. Um, but the prince is where we get the term Machiavellian from. Obligatory Wikipedia quote, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, he was a diplomat in the Florentine Republic. It, Italy, uh, Renaissance Italy. Um, he used to live in a state that was governed by the Medici dynasty. And the Medici dynasty was quite the thing at the time, right? And eventually the Medicis were kicked out of Flor- uh, kicked out of Florentine. Um, and Machiavelli, became kind of like an ambassador, then became a chancellor. He basically became prime minister in the end, but started off as an ambassador. And in that time, 14-year period, he was involved with some of the most influential players in Renaissance Europe that you can think of, right? He was in charge of a town, Florence, right here, in the middle of Renaissance Italy. And this is... Basically, Game of Thrones, real life, right? Period. Um, you're talking about a period in time where your allies are your enemies, your enemies are your allies, and we still haven't done lunch yet. Um, and, and this changes constantly. So he was involved in issues with, well, <laughs> all over, uh, and very, very diplomatic problems. Eventually, the Medicis come back into Florence, and Niccolo Machiavelli is arrested for treason and tortured for about three or four days. Um, held on to not confessing to being a uh, part of a conspiracy against the Medici dynasty. You know, they put him on the rack. I think that he's quoted as saying that he went on the rack like nine times, blah, 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 blah. Um, and eventually, a interesting pope came along, um, Leo X. And... Uh, Leo the Tenth is quite an interesting character. So what he does is he does a general amnesty, uh, and, uh, Machiavelli is pardoned and is allowed to live in exile away from Florence, but in his townhouse about 10 kilometers away. Also, interestingly enough, do you know that this is the Pope that gave, do you know that every British monarch since Henry the Eighth has used the term defender of the faith? Right. And most people think that that title comes from him starting up the Church of England. It actually isn't. The term defender of the faith is what this guy gave to uh, Leo X, gave to uh, Henry VIII after writing a rebuttal to Martin Luther, um, the other famous Protestant, which is quite strange. Um, but anyway, Leo X pardons uh, Machiavelli. Unfortunately, he's never in high esteem again. He's put off to his vineyards. He has to work there. And he has this idea that um, he's going to reach out to uh, the Medici that is in charge of the Florence, uh, the Florentine dynasty right now, uh, Leo the Magnificent, and he's going to write a job application, right? He's going to write a book specifically uh, to Leo the Magnificent that says, you know, hey, this is my thoughts. So it's basically a job advert. It wasn't meant for to be published and read 500 years later for stars. So his opening gambit, uh, just to give you a rough idea, um, is quite cool. Basically what he says is, is, hey, look, people will try and give you gifts to show you that they love you, right? You're magnificent. And it, whatever those people value will be the gift that they give you. So if they value horses, you'll get horses. If they value gold, you'll get gold. Me, I don't have much to give, but the thing that I value very, very much is the things that I learned dealing with powerful people. Cool. So with a little bit of artistic license and for fun, let's see how security could do through Machiavelli's eyes, right? So the thing is, over the years, I've been root on lots of things. Lots of things that I, I once rooted solar panels, right? I, I, 
I don't know, it's a bit weird. Um, th- there's a whole lo- host of really random shit that I got shell on over the years. And mostly because it was harder to fail than it was to succeed. You know, in a lot of cases, I owned it by doing admin admin, you know, uh, cool. While I would like to believe I'll take the win. No problems. I'm, I've got no shame there. But in a lot of cases, as I say, it's harder to fail than it is to succeed. In a lot of cases, why does this happen? Well, there's a few different reasons why it happens. But one I'd like to pick on particularly today would be the fortress mentality. We've all seen it before. We've all heard that story of, ah, but it's an internal system. We don't have to worry. It's inside the network. Like, yo, uh, do, do you know what the internet means? That means interconnected networks. So it being internal, everything's external if you try hard enough. Um, but they don't get that. Also, we've all heard this before, right? Yeah, no, yeah the firewall handles that. Uh, this happens constantly. Recently, I was told that the firewall scans malware. I'm like, oh shit, I don't like the firewall doing firewall things. Never mind malware things now, but okay, cool. But this is what we see in corporate states all the time. And the reality is, in a lot of ways, your fortresses suck. Um, they're decrepit, they're falling, you haven't invested in them, they don't do the job. And when you pwn a com- uh, when you pwn a company's developers, it's sort of putting me off because my slides are slightly over. If any of you have got OCD, <laughs> yeah, shit, sorry. Um, pwn a company's developers or Compromise the IT department. Um, it looks like a career in IT right there, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm going to digress for a second. It's an absolutely awesome story. I'm really sorry. Right. So my daughter, um, called me up one day and she said to me, Aaron, what are you doing? Well, dad, what are you doing on the 11th of February, 2019? This, this, this was in April last year. I'm like, um, I'm, I'm not. Sure, but I guess, like, it's a very specific question for a 10 year old. Why? Ah, my school was wondering if you could come and talk. I'm like, uh huh. Why? Well, they'd like to, they'd, they'd, they'd like to speak to a hacker. I'm like, well, why does your school know that I'm a hacker? Well, I told them. Okay. And what did they say to you? Well, they didn't believe me. I'm like, uh huh. Well, why did they believe you now? Well, we watched you on YouTube. I'm like, <laughs> Seems legitimate, right? So anyway, eventually I end up in a school in Scotland speaking to a bunch of 10-year-olds, which are 10-year-olds and 7-year-olds. They're two classes. And it's very cool because the 10-year-olds, they were all trying to play cool, right? So when I come and they're super interested, but they're very much worried about what the person next to them, like, oh, no. And my daughter's got this big smile on her face. I'm super nervous. I've done lots of public speaking, but the minute they said, can you speak to your children, your, your child and her school friends? I'm like, no, don't make me do it. Please don't make me do it. I'm scared. No, no. I, please, let me go and speak to the InfoSec crowd. Please don't make me do it. But of course, I can't say no to my daughter. So anyway, I do this talk to a bunch of seven-year-olds and they are very different from the 10-year-olds. So firstly, the 10 year olds are all sitting cool at the table and like, yeah, I've got Snapchat and blah, 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 and all being kind of nonchalant about everything, trying to play it cool. And the seven year olds, they came into the room running. Ah, And it was just chaos. I'm like, oh, these are my people. Awesome. I love them. Carry on. Do you want some? Here's some Red Bull. Go on. (laughs) And eventually, they all got their cushions and sat on the floor. So I got my cushions and sat on the floor. The teacher made me stand back up again. I'm like, oh, sorry. Um, <coughs> and I started speaking to them. I started speaking to them about cybersecurity, right? Sorry for the buzzword. And I'd been speaking to them all and saying, hey, how many of you have got Snapchat? And I was generally mortified when I asked my daughter's group because all of the hands went up. <sighs> like, but you're 10. Why do you need Snapchat? And basically, I said to him, you know, what cybersecurity advice were you given? Who set up the account? Blah, 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 blah. So I I start talking to the seven-year-olds. I'm like, okay, so who set up your account? Ah, my mom, my dad, my brother, blah, 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 blah. Great. Everyone that was set up by an adult, keep your hands up. What, did you get security advice from them? You know, how to, how to behave online? 
half of them put their hands down. There's a bunch of seven-year-olds. I'm like, oh, shit. And the other bunch, I said, you know, what was the advice you were given? I was given uh, not to accept strangers. I'm like, okay, what were you given? Not to accept strangers. What about you? Not to accept strangers. I'm like, okay, so did everybody get told not to accept strangers? Yeah. What else did they say? I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I'd like to ask you a question. How do you know someone's a stranger? Because your mum pretended to be you, set up a Snapchat account, and then added your friends. So how do you know that I'm not pretending to be one of your school friends and doing the same? And the, the ki kids had great answers. But there was a little boy, and I'm not going to lie, he looked like he had a career in IT at seven. Um, <laughs> And I, I mean, I had a warm spot to him when I said to the whole class, like, okay, does everybody know who a hacker is? And the boy's hands up like that. They're intelligent people that like playing with computers. I'm like, I fucking love this kid. Who is he? Um, and later on, he puts his hand up and I say to him, how do you verify who they are? And he says, well, the first thing I do is I tell him to take a photograph. I'm like, uh-huh. And I tell him, like, hold three fingers up or touch the nose or hold the ear or something that I know that they have taken that photograph. So I say to him, you know, and I'm like, oh, shit, this is a seven-year-old. What's going on here? And as, as I'm about to say to him, great work. And he says, oh, the other thing that I do, when you go to Google, you know, they've got that little camera icon. What I do is I upload the, the avatar picture to Google and I see where else it's gone. I'm like, holy shit, the seven-year-old is explaining to me Google reverse image searches and how to validate if the image is genuine or not. And I'm like, who taught you this? He's like, no, I worked it out myself. I'm like, whoa, cool. Have you ever thought about security? Do, do you want a job? <laughs> What's the minimum wage? Do you need health insurance? Okay. Um, so uh, I, I will not share the young gentleman's name, but we'll call him the seven-year-old hacker. Uh, I hope that they uh, they find some use for this kid's skills, because otherwise, I imagine we'll all go to visit him in jail when he's about 15, right? <laughs> but, oh, shit, he's got better OPSEC and security skills than actually all of my customers. Uh, and I, they, I spend a long time working with them. This kid, boom. But anyway, I digress. And the only reason I digress is it's just two people that look like they should be working in IT. Sorry. So anyway, compromise an IT department or lol, pwn the Wi-Fi because that's not hard, right? Or own a bunch of these printers or any other printers because, hey, hacking printers, we've been doing that for years. Let's do it some more. There's a whole bunch of new hacks in there. It's fucking awesome. Lol, wreck some VoIP phones. And then all of a sudden, your big security fortress is a bunch of rocks. Awesome. Well done. So, the fortress mentality has some flaws, but what would Machiavelli have said about using the fortress mentality? And if we look to chapter 20 of the book, it actually has a specific uh, shtick about fortresses. And it goes a long way to say, you know, uh, if a prince is scared of foreign invaders, he should not be building fortresses. If he's scared of his people, totally build fortresses. So that's kind of really easy to steal that in security, right? That a security team who is more afraid of their users should be using fortresses. But the security team that's more afraid of, of strangers should maybe focus their security efforts uh, a little bit more robustly than building high walls. Um, obligatory uh, Lebowski picture. Woohoo. And the thing is, is historically speaking, uh, the fortress, the issues with fortresses have slightly been well documented. I'm not sure if you know, but people who hide in fortresses, we know where you are. It's the big building with a high wall. You're in it. So for starters, your enemies know where you are before you even start. And secondly, you don't actually have to be effective in a siege to cripple a fortress. Just like you don't have to actually be that effective in a DDoS to, to, to cause problems to a company. Um, and if you're wondering what this picture is, this is the famous uh, Athens versus Sparta. Does anybody know the story about this? So this is a great story about should have updated their antivirus, basically. Um, so Athens 
and their big fortress decided that they were going to eventually destroy their foe, the Spartans. And the Spartans went, lol. <laughs> we, we, we are warrior people and you're philosophers. Ah, but we've got a navy. Like, bring it. So the Athens did. And they started a war with the Spartans. They'd done it a few times, to be fair. So they start a war with the Spartans and they go and hide in their big fortress. And they shut all the doors. They say, don't worry, we're going to be supplied from our naval feet. We will stay in the fortress and the Spartans will stay outside and they'll eventually either have to go or they'll start attacking us because they're frustrated. But either way, we'll get them because we've got a plan, right? Awesome. Unfortunately, they also got the bubonic plague. Um, and that will really screw up your attempts to piss off your neighbor, apparently. So eventually, in the fortress, the Spartans didn't even do it. They just waited. They just sat there and waited. And eventually, the Athenians brought in the bubonic plague. Everybody got ill. The military leader involved in this died. So the plan went to hell in a handbasket. And then eventually, they were completely and utterly utterly annihilated by the Spartans. They had to do an unconditional surrender in the end, right? Um, but of course, they had the security infrastructure and the advancement of the military infrastructure that would be the Navy. They were far more superior than Navy. So this is the problem with fortresses, that they're very good at keeping your people in check, but they're not very good at dealing with problems. Like, the, like we've got the bubonic plague. Well, that's cool. We're stuck in these four walls and we're all going to die. That's not a good position to put yourself in, right? Um, but fortresses are not the only thing the book talks about. We can actually apply uh, some of this to, to red teaming or, or threat hunting or proactive security or whatever the, the new term is. Probably be purple team soon or something like that. All right, is there a purple teamer in the house? Right. Okay. You know you guys were a parody 10 years ago, right? <laughs> I, I, I'm uh, sorry, I'm not trolling you really. Um, so red teaming. And we go back to chapter 20 again, right? And basically what Machiavelli is talking about here, I'm not going to read things out to you. Um, you're all adults. Well, you're all adults in, in age, probably not in spirit. Um, later on tonight though, but don't. Uh, but basically what he says is, is that for a prince to be successful, he really needs an enemy, right? Fortune, if fortune loves the prince, they will give them an enemy because it's only in the struggle, it's only in the struggle that you can be victorious and loved, right? Cool. So we can sort of reapply that again, right? So instead of, you know, the prince, what we can say is it's be good for the blue team to, to organize some shit with the red team and actually win. But by the way, just out of interest, uh, should the blue team at least win sometimes? No. Right? Okay. Hands up if you think the blue team should win sometimes. Okay. And the rest of you, I don't care what you believe. You are the good people. Right? <laughs> the, the red team has to lose sometimes. Right? It has to. Because otherwise, why do you keep on testing them? They suck. You've proved it. Now help them grow. Um, but anyway, as we say, uh, Machiavelli sees the importance of causing chaos, of being attacked, of defending that. And as all of you know, that we learn the most insecurity once we've been hacked, once we've been attacked. Because all of those plans, all of those ideas, all of those things, it, it, what's the, what's the famous Mike Tyson quote? You all have a plan until you're punched in the face. Um, and security is very much the same thing. It, it, I paraphrase it, but it is something everybody's got a plan until you, you, I hit you in the nose or something like that. But anyway, as a, re as a, as a, as a, uh, blue team, you, you should get your ass kicked every now and again because that victory will give you confidence. It'll make your people good. It will make you stronger, right? I know I'm a bit like this at this moment, right? <laughs> but what would Machiavelli say about building a security team? Well, Machiavelli was quite a complex character, and you'd probably been interested in if you inherit a security team or build a security team. And I've been involved in both, uh, both processes. Um, and what I can tell you is the kind of person that I am, I much prefer to build a security team. 
because you get to see the people, you get to know the people, you get to, to work with them. When you inherit a security team, what you have is a lot of complexity that you're only going to be able to find out on the ground, right? You're, you're not going to find out that your, your senior pen tester actually secretly has been searching for new jobs for the past three months, blah, 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 blah. You'll only find these things out on the ground when you see it. And I'm not going to read the wall of text again, but basically what Machiavelli says here is, yo, if you take a new place over that's different in customs uh, and all of this sort of stuff, if it's different different, and you're going to change it, you need to go and live there. And he talks about uh, Alexander the Great here, uh, when Alexander the Great was great at stealing other people's land, apparently. But at the end of the day, he was very good at holding on to it too. And this is because in a lot of cases, uh, he would go and live amongst the people and it enables you to fix problems earlier on. This is another one that's super simple to adapt. We can just say, yo, look, if you take over a new area and you are the security officer that's responsible for it, please don't do this job remotely. You can't be effective. Yeah, I have to be on the ground with the troops because it enables you to see problems straight away. How many of you have had senior security people making decisions about your security on the ground that have never even been to your office? Right? I mean, seriously. Um, of course there will be problems with this. Of course there are. What happens with that famous firewall when it detects ransomware? Oh my god, please stop clicking on the fucking things that say .exe. Uh, I'll tell you a small story. Uh, I got a panicked phone call from a HR department a while ago. They're like, um, we've clicked on ransomware. What should we do? Like, uh, don't click on it? Um, like, no, no, no. Like, what should we do? Like, unplug the system? We've done that already. Okay, then cool. Just tell IT to roll it back. No problems. But can you send me the files? Just so that we can have a look. Yeah, no problems. We can't send them out. The firewall's blocked them. Well, hang on a second. How did they get in if you're going to block them on the way out? And it turns out they weren't reading the inside of zips very properly. And they received a zip with resume.doc.exe and resume.pdf.exe and a profile picture. And they were like, nobody, nobody, nobody at any point went, that's a bit odd. They just unzipped it and double clicked on it. And it went, oh shit, ransomware, unplugged it. The first question that you have to ask yourself is, why did it evade Sophos, right? I mean, that that's the first thing that we should say here because ClamAV picked this thing up instantaneously. And I'm gonna say that ClamAV is, that should be your bare minimum, uh, I, I believe. But anyway, cool. It's really like this. You know, when you look at it, right? <laughs> it's super, it, super. And really, the problem is, you know, the obligatory Lebowski picture again. Um, but we didn't really train anybody properly here. We can blame the tools, right? We say, well, the AV didn't pick it up. And you know what? The, the, the anti-malware device didn't pick it up. And blah, 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 blah. The security UTM, blah, 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 didn't pick it up. But it fucking looked dodgy. And what we hadn't done is taught the stuff the importance of, you see, if that looks a bit weird, probably not to do it, right? But actually, Machiavelli, it's almost like giving staff tools, arms, to be able to defend themselves against strangers trying to, to steal things from them. Machiavelli has this great point. And basically what he says is when he goes into a principality, the... Um, where the citizens have been unarmed, it's super wise to arm the citizens because they will be forever in your great, uh, forever in your gratitude for releasing them. But more importantly, they'll be really good at defending you as partisans. So arm them. So hey, we can do the whole user awareness training under this too. That it doesn't make sense for a security officer to go into uh, a new place and be very restrictive. It makes sense to start educating as soon as soon as possible to arm people up because the only effective firewall that you're ever going to have is your users, unfortunately, right? And we need to wake up to that because there isn't going to be a next gen 2.0 blockchain assisted, blah, 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 other thing, right? It's just going to be pish as it always has. 
right? Your only effective firewall is people. Educate them. And you know what? Maybe they'll fuck up every now and again, but so do you guys. So it's all fair. Now, I know it's supposed to be half an hour. I know I'm slightly over, so I'm going to wrap up a little bit, right? So the talk was supposed to be about a little bit of about fun, but it's really about good governance. Our industry is about good governance. I knew that things were really crazy when the long-haired hacker in the business meeting was saying, you know, we really need some good policy here. That's when I'm like, oh, shit, the world is inversed. It's upside down. Maybe when they were making black holes in Swiss mountains, the, the parallel universe happened. But when you have hackers start talking about policy and governance as something to be able to help users survive, your security is pretty fucked at that point, right? Um, but we, as an industry, tend to uh, love geeky things, but we don't tend to look further back for other solutions. Uh, we find that in tech industries, every innovation is, is a new revolution, right? Um, but a lot of lessons can be learned in history about good governance. Helping users to be safe is a governance job, right? That That's what we're there to do. Also, super hot take, but Machiavelli wasn't very Machiavellian. And I can give you probably two big reasons. Firstly, he was a bit of a loser. Um, so, he never got employed again. He basically wrote a few books, but after he wrote that job application, it was thrown in a drawer and forgotten about and published five years after his death. Do you know the prince was never called the prince in Machiavelli's lifetime? Uh, it was called that after his death when it was published by the publishing house. Um, so it was never supposed to be that. Also, not super Machiavellian to actually write the rules down and then give it to people. Um, it seems to me the more Machiavellian would have been, I'll shut the fuck up and benefit from it, and I'll win that way. So, yeah. Here are the three hot takes that I want you to take away today. Remember, fortresses defend you from your own people, right? That's what they're there for. And of course, we do have to defend ourselves against our own people from time to time. They do do some dumb stuff, right? They're human. But we have to be vigilant that when we say our security, it is the security that starts out of the firewall. Um, because otherwise, you're just the Athenians waiting for the buponic plague. Um, if you get hacked, it's a great opportunity. Um, don't forget that. Like, if you are doing good work, people will target you. And learning how to defend that will make you better. So don't panic. And remember, failure is a natural side effect of, of trying. Or trying is the first step towards failure. One of the two, right? I can't believe that you missed the joke there, but okay. I feel bad that I have to explain it, but okay. And with that, I would like to... Uh, I'm 10 minutes over, right? Sorry. Okay. And with that, I hope you've enjoyed your B-Size Liverpool and uh, enjoy the after party. You have to, like, leave very, very soon, right? Cool. Thank you very much. You've been awesome. Goodbye. <laughs>